I didn't bring my shaver, folks. <clears throat> I left my shaver at home. So because I didn't bring my trimmer, my shaver, I need to shave. I may have to go buy another one. <clears throat> Good to see you this morning. Glory to the Father. Glory to the Son. Glory to the Holy Spirit. You know <clears throat> how this works, right? So let me just do this here. You know how this works, peoples. Christmas and the Eucharist in Luke 24. You know how this works, right? Remember, I'm in a hotel dependent on hotel internet, which is terrible. So be patient. Now, you know the rules. Please respect the rules. You know the rules. <clears throat> this is a class. We want the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. We, his instruments. Let the Holy Spirit use me to be his mouthpiece. And we ask the Holy Spirit to take over. We are his disciples. He owns us. We belong to him. So <clears throat> no relevant questions, no pontificating, no distraction. You're going to engage me because I read your comments to make sure you're getting it. If you're going to come and disrespect the rules, that means you're deliberately trying to disrespect the channel, us, and the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to insult you and your origins. So I'm warning you. Let this be run by the Spirit. Let it be a class governed by the Spirit. We want the Holy Spirit not only to take over the session, we give him everything. I give the Holy Spirit my ministry, my YouTube channel. May he destroy censorship, close the door of opposition. I give the Holy Spirit <clears throat> my possessions, everything. We all come in agreement. We give ourselves to the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit to own us fully and completely, possess us perfectly. Our loved ones, my daughters, their mother, for the glory of Jesus Christ. He is the teacher. We are his disciples. You're not my disciples. May the Holy Spirit correct any mistake I make. Save me from error. To hate error and sin passionately and to walk in obedience for the glory of Jesus Christ. And this is where you can help me. Pray God will give me the power. Miraculous self-control, self-restraint, self-constraint. Control our passions. That we are doers of the word to obey Jesus Christ, not to be hypocrites, destroy the beams in our eyes, no double lives, not to be liars and deceivers, not to fall into a scandal, but glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and love Jesus by obeying the Lord. And ask the Lord to heal me, heal us all, heal our loved ones, my daughters, their mothers, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, physically, and set me free from lust, which I struggle with, and food addiction. Give me victory to glorify Jesus, crush Satan under our feet by the blood of Jesus Christ. Pray for one another, pray for me for that. So I can finish the race with integrity and ask the Holy Spirit to give us discipline to get to church more regularly. That's what I need to do. Practice what I preach. And we ask the Holy Spirit to be out of fights with the beauty of Jesus Christ, destroy our vanity, our pride, our arrogance, our ego. <clears throat> and I also need the Holy Spirit to give me the discipline to stay healthy and fit and use my health to glorify the Lord. Strengthen my throat because as you see, my throat is not what it used to be. Strengthen my heart, my lungs, my chest, my arteries with the help that comes from his beautiful, glorious presence. Make my voice please interiors. And may the Holy Spirit bless the internet connection. And he come to the forefront. We decrease. Jesus increases in our lives and the lives of our loved ones, my daughters, even their mother. And he sits thrown upon our hearts. And we're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, purified, cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, purged in the purifying fire of the Holy Spirit. Take over, Holy Spirit, and help me not to be a nuisance to the people in the hotel room, but to be the light of Jesus. Save us men from Jezebels and save our sisters from wolves. We trust in you. Own us, please, for the glory of Christ. Give me perfect recall of every jot, total portion of Scripture to glorify Father, Son, and Spirit. And muzzle the dogs and teach them the fear of the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So you know the rules, right? So this is what I told you. As long as the audio is good, don't worry about the lagging. <clears throat> this is the best we can do. This is the best we can do. So please do not complain about the lagging. If the audio is perfect, that's all that matters. Because it's not just here in the hotel room. Even at Avery's place, God Logic, his hotel was bad. I mean, his connection was bad. Spirit, we ask you, save me from error. Confusion, stammering. Correct my lisp. Save me from stuttering. Perfectly exegeting and recalling scripture for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, your eternal love. <clears throat> even at Avery's place. If you remember yesterday, even at his place, the internet was terrible. So it's not just the hotel. Even at his place, the internet was terrible. But we ask the Holy Spirit to bless the audio sound so you can hear for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. So be patient, guys. All right? This is the best we can do. Can you handle it? The lagging? 
Sincere apologize for what, Paula? I don't even know what you're talking about. Can you handle the lagging? I got to go shave my beard because it makes me look old and beat. And guys, if you wonder why my eyes, my sleep is not the best. I don't sleep that well, right? Neck, pillow, may God give us comfort and give us perfect rest. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. So, you okay? Is that all right? So, no lagging, right? As long as the audio is good. So, we're going to go into Luke 24, and also we're going to go into... <clears throat> The Christmas story, Luke 1, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Because we're told in, told in the Didache, an early Christian manual, recite the Lord's Prayer three times a day. That's in the Didache. Recite the Lord's Prayer three times a day and fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. That's chapter 8 of the Didache. May the Holy Spirit give me perfect recall of all the facts. And you can read the Didache online for free. Let me just find it. All right. The Lord's Prayer three times a day. You can read online on newadvent.org. It's worth your time to read. You can read it in an hour, but try to read it with understanding. So let's do this. We have a lot of meat. What better way? Thank you, Jenny. Not as great as you. Lord bless you and your daughter. What better way to spend the weekend than with the people of God being used of the Holy Spirit to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ? I pray if the Lord is pleased. All of you regulars, I pray if the Lord is pleased, I'll meet you face to face. Why? So I can hug you and fellowship with you, make you laugh by the grace of our God. If the Lord is pleased, I will see you on this side of glory, if the Lord is pleased. But pray for the support that I use the money responsibly, and the Lord will protect it from the IRS, and I use it to glorify Jesus and to do ministry and to take care of my daughters. But I'd love to see you guys face to face. Now, if you're sisters then I can only shake your hand, right? But I'd love to see you on this side of glory. But if not, we will see each other before the throne of Jesus Christ because there will be perfected. No more sin, no more pain, no more suffering, no more gossip, no more hatred, no more selfishness. It will be pure, perfect love for one another. Loving God perfectly, being filled with his love and loving one another. But pray for me. If you're in the Seattle area, Seattle, Washington, if you're in Seattle, Washington, Lord willing, I want to come up by the end of February. So I should be there in a couple of weeks. Pray that God will show me and confirm for the glory of Father, Son, and Spirit. Gene, why are you asking me how much time I spend in adoration? Do you want me to advertise it to the world? Please, Gene, don't ask me those questions. All right, now, glory to Father, Son, we need you, Father. We need you, Lord Jesus Christ. We need you, Holy Spirit. Here's the link for the Didache. This was a manual written to the churches of the apostles. It's an apostolic document, meaning written at the time of the apostles. <clears throat> this gives you a window in how the churches established by the apostles would worship, the virtues they would cultivate, the sins they would avoid, how they prayed, how they worshiped, how they served. So if you want to know how the churches of the apostles would pray and fast and, and worship and the deeds they were commanded to cultivate and the sins they were commanded to avoid. It's there. Interestingly, in this document, you'll find the Christians condemning abortion as murder, condemning abortion as murder, right here in this document, and pedophilia, condemned as murder. Paula, you didn't leave Islam because of me. You didn't leave Islam because of me. You left Islam because the Holy Spirit worked through human agents, and I was one of them for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So stay in love with Jesus, Paula, even though I don't think that's your picture, but that's okay. All right, now let me show you what it says about abortion. You ready? And we're going to begin. This is a short read. You can read it in, right? You can read it in an hour. Right? Chapter 2. Look at this. Jennifer, for everyone else. Click the link and read it here. In the first century, in the lifetime of the apostles, the churches were told to condemn abortion. It's murder. And history attests, this is a fact, that when the pagans would abandon their children to die, the Christians would come and deliver those children. They would come and save the children and raise them. This is the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Fact. Lord bless the connection, and I pray I'm not in here. Let's read. Chapter 2. Read with me. Okay, this is Didache. 
the second commandment, gross sins forbidden. And the second commandment of the teaching, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery. May we practice what we preach for the glory of Jesus Christ. You shall not commit <clears throat> pederasty. Pederasty is violating, sodomizing young children, specifically boys. That means Muhammad would have been condemned to hell by the church. You shall not, cannot commit fornication. Now, brethren, pray for one another. Pray for me, your servant. The Lord Jesus, give us the power to be sexually pure. No sex before marriage. And I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I struggle. But we trust the Lord to save us from our flesh. Save us men from Jezebel so we don't stumble and save our sisters from men. Pray for one another and pray for me that the Lord Jesus will seal me to never touch a woman until I'm married. I'm not telling you I'm a saint. I struggle, but I trust the Lord to save me from my flesh. Because you see, the Bible and this manual says to Christians, no fornication. No fornication. You cannot have sex before marriage. I know it hurts. Brothers, sisters, Jesus knows what's best for us. He knows. Honor your bodies. And women, do not let men honor dishonor, men on dishonor because I'm going to let you know how men are. If men are having sex with you, they don't feel any need to commit to you because they're already getting what they want. Lord, save us. And may the Lord save us men from being wolves and save you sisters and save us men from Jezebels. It's right there. Now, let's continue reading. Yet flee from sexual immorality. But now, you shall not steal. You shall not practice magic, nor sorcery, no witchcraft, no fortune telling, no horoscopes. No horoscopes, right? You shall not practice witchcraft. You shall not murder a child by abortion. I repeat that two more times. You shall not murder a child by abortion. One more time. The followers of our Lord Jesus from the beginning condemned abortion as murder. There is no pro-choice. It's God's choice. You shall not murder a child by abortion nor kill that which is begotten. And you will not toss out your babies to die like many of the pagans did. You shall not covet the things of your neighbor. You shall not forswear yourself. You shall not bear false witness. May the Holy Spirit give us the power to hate these sins and practice what we preach. You shall not speak evil. You shall not bear <clears throat> no grudge. Evil, right? You're not going to talk about evil things, dirty things, defiling things as some do. You shall not be double-minded, right? double minded. You know what it is? One day you're on fire. Next day you're, I don't know, man, you know, uh, I don't know about Christianity or, yeah, no. Nor double tongue. Don't speak from both sides of, out of your mouth. For to be double tongues is a snare of death. Your speech shall not be false nor empty. In other words, don't speak useless, stupid things. Let your conversations be fruitful, right? That doesn't mean you can't joke, okay, you self-righteous pigs but fulfilled by deed. So here, empty speech means you say one thing, but do another. Let your deeds confirm what you say. Doers of the word. You shall not be covetous. Don't be envious and jealous of what your brother has or your sister has. Nor rapacious, oh, that word. nor a hypocrite, nor evil disposed, disposed to wanting to do evil. Nor haughty. Don't be proud and arrogant because you're nothing in comparison to the Lord. You shall not take evil counsel against your neighbor. Do not plot to harm your neighbor. You shall not hate any man, but some you shall reprove. You will correct and rebuke. I don't think Jesus in you. All right? And concerning, let me put the rest of it on, and then one more. I don't think Jesus in you. Right. And concerning, some you shall pray. So for some people, you got to pray. Some you shall love more than your own life. Some, not all. That was you have to make a judgment call. That's chapter two. Did it, Kay? And I gave you the link. Now, now the part about the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Chapter eight. Chapter eight. And then we begin. We'll pray the Lord's Prayer. Here it is, chapter eight. You fast Wednesdays and Fridays. Fast Wednesdays and Fridays. And you say the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Here you go. Chapter 8. Focus. Help me to help you stay focused, brethren. Concerning fasting and prayer, the Lord's Prayer. But let not your fast be with the hypocrites. Talking about the Jews. Who would fast Mondays and Thursdays. And ironically, 
Muhammad, a Jew wannabe, wanting to appease the Jews. Did you know in Islam, because of Muhammad's sunnah, it is recommended that Muslims fast Monday and Thursdays because Muhammad was imitating the Jews and the Jews would fast Mondays and Thursdays. And yet the true followers of the Lord Jesus said, no, you don't fast like them. You fast Wednesdays and Fridays. So if you ever wondered where the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the Assyrian Church got this custom of fasting Wednesdays and Fridays, they got it from the apostles. They got it from the disciples of our Lord Jesus who instructed the churches fast Wednesdays and Fridays. Here it is, chapter 8, dedicate. So the churches didn't make it up. But they didn't just tell you abstain from meat. Say, at least you guys got it easy. They'll tell you no meat. No, Wednesdays and Fridays, you fast. No food. Right? You got it easier. No meat. Okay, now. But let not your fast be with the hypocrites. For they fast on the second and fifth day of the week. Now count. Second day is Monday. Fifth day is Thursday. Sunday's the first. Monday's the second. Wednesday. Right? I'm sorry, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So you don't fast Monday, Thursday, which the Jews did. So what do you fast? But fast on the fourth day, that's Wednesday, and the preparation, the day that the Jews would prepare for Sabbath, Friday. Neither pray as the hypocrites, but as the Lord commanded in his gospel. See, this document, right, heavily depended on Matthew's gospel or the same tradition that Matthew included in his inspired gospel. Thus pray. Now, how do you pray and how many times? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done as is in heaven, so on earth. Give us today our daily needful bread. Forgive us our debt as we also forgive our debtors. Bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So how many times should you pray this or evil? For yours is the power of the glory forever. Thrice, three times in the day, thus pray. So this is why. David, does your mother fast from the Shia? David, does your mother fast from the Shia? Your mother, that Shia whore? Does she stop having sex with them on Wednesday and Friday, that dirty little whore? All right, so let's pray, guys. You ready? Are you guys ready? It's the Didache, the teaching of the 12, yes. The Didache. You guys ready? Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever. And to ages of ages, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Let's begin. The Eucharistic presence of our Lord in Luke 24. I've done this before, but we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something repetitively until it becomes second nature. So let's focus. Class has begun. By the grace of God. We're going to discuss the Lord's appearance to two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Emmaus, Emmaus Road. Starts from Luke 24, verse 13, Luke 24, 13, all the way to 35. Pay attention. Class has begun. I'm going to show you nuggets that the Holy Spirit was pleased to make known to us. Everything good is from the Spirit. All wisdom that is pure is from the Spirit. We give Him the glory. So what He shares with me, I will share with you because that's my duty if I'm called to serve and teach. So let's focus. Do not let the demons distract you. Okay. Now, brother, if you're a Christian, David, if you're a Christian, okay, let's see if you are. You know, you don't ask a Christian whether to fast because in Matthew 6, verses 1 to 15, specifically Matthew 6, all the way verses 1 to 6, you're told not to announce your acts of piety, of righteousness. Do not announce that you're praying or you're fasting. Keep it between you and God. So why would you ask me this? Do you want me to sin against the Lord? So if you are a Christian, David, you know not to ask someone if he's fasting or she's fasting. Leave that between the person and the Lord Jesus Christ. Lest you become 
a stumbling block and cause that person to boast about the deeds he does for the Lord Jesus Christ and then lose that reward that he does because he's now getting the praise of men. So can you be a little wise? If you're not a Muslim, then don't ask me those questions because someone who knows the Bible doesn't ask those questions unless you're a stupid bastard of the devil. Right? Right? You do not ask a fellow brother or sister if they are fasting, praying, or taking Eucharist. That's between them and God and their priest whom they confess to. Leave that between them and the Lord. Now, if you know a person and you know that they are lazy and slothful or in sin, that's different because they use their buddy. So you got a buddy that names Christ, but you know, you see, lazy, slothful, and in sin, then you have the responsibility to rebuke that person in love. But you do not ask someone if he fasts. That's Matthew 6, verses 1 to 15, when our Lord says, Do not be like the hypocrites who make lengthy prayers in order to appear holy and pious for the praise of men. Or when they fast, right, they look droopy, right? They look tired in order to get attention. Look, I'm fasting. Do not ask such stupid questions. Leave that between the person and God. Learn your faith so I don't have to insult you again. Don't ask me what I do. I pray I obey Christ perfectly. May he save me from being a hypocrite and I don't stumble. But no one prays as much as he or she should. No one fasts as much as he or she should. We need to do more. Are you with me there? So don't ask these questions. Never again. Okay, don't be stupid. You know, at first I thought you're stupid, but when you open your mouth, now I know you're stupid. You convinced me. All right, are we ready now? Let's get into Luke 24. Luke 24. It's in the Bible. You want me to quote it? The Lord says, don't, don't go and make a show of your piety. Look at me, I'm fasting by looking slow. Whoa, whoa, whoa. what's wrong? Wait till, oh man, I'm fasting, bro. Or then praying. Lengthy prayers with vain words, babbling, in order to impress people with your so-called piety. Don't ask these stupid questions again, man. Stupid, man. I mean, come on. May the Lord give me the power to practice what I preach. Anyway, let's begin. The story begins with the Lord appearing that first Easter Sunday resurrection appearing to two disciples on the road to Emmaus the first Easter Sunday when he rose physically bodily in his glorified flesh body. Right? Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the God-man, God in flesh. Now, the disciples did not recognize the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples did not recognize the Lord Jesus Christ, one of whom was named Cleopas. Why? That's what we're going to talk about. And when do you recognize the Lord? Now, I already did a session on this. But creatures repetition, we hear something repetitively. So Luke 24, 13 to 35. So please don't distract me. Let's focus and learn. Why did they not recognize him? The power of sin. The effect of sin. So let's. this is Bible study. Listen. Mods, you know what to do with the trolls. Let's begin. Lord, bless your word and help us to obey it and live it out. Help me not to be a hypocrite. And behold, two of them were going that same day to a village named Emmaus, which was 60 stadia from Jerusalem. Don't ask me about geography. I suck. I don't even know what a stadia is. I mean, I could look up at a commentary, but. Uh. And they were conversing with each other about all these things which had happened about Jesus being beaten, whipped and killed. They were like shocked in a state of shock and disbelief. Now, remember, it's the third day. It's Sunday. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself approached and was going with them. There's a lot of meat in these passages, so we got to tread lightly. So please pay attention. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Why? Why were their eyes prevented from recognizing him? Let me finish this section. I'm going to explain. And he said to them, what are these words that you are discussing one another? As you are walking, and they stood still looking sad. 
looking sad. All right, so let me explain why they were unable to recognize him. One more time. Why were they unable to recognize him? Now, you guys ready for me? Holy Spirit, guide me. You are the teacher. Save me from error. error. Here it is, this part right again. Focus, LEP. LEP, I think you're a dumb bastard. You're a piece of garbage. You are a son of a spiritual whore. Your mother should be thrown in jail for giving birth to a whore like you. So that make you happy? I hope you're happy now. But their, their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Okay? Their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Now say something else so I can insult your mother more. Their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. No, K May. It has nothing to do with Mary. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. What am I mad about? The fact that Mary's not paying attention, thinking she is, thinking this is Mary Magdalene, when it has nothing to do with Mary Magdalene. I just read for K May, K May, not Mary, K May, that these are two disciples on their way to Emmaus. Had nothing to do with Mary Magdalene. I don't know if she's paying attention or she's busy in another world. All right, Jennifer, is that you? All right, here, I told her I was going to make her a mod. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. What am I mad about? A man about that K is pretending to be listening. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. What am I mad about? Okay, now can we focus? Now let me tell you why their eyes were prevented recognizing him. According to the teaching of Scripture, Logo. According to the teaching of Scripture, sin will <clears throat> hinder you from seeing, recognizing, and believing. Sin and Satan. Satan and sin. Satan tempting you. Satan influencing you. And sin that resides in your flesh. Their job is to prevent you from being able to see clearly and believe and understand God's word, lest you be saved. Now, here's where you come in. The more you give in to sin, the more you justify sin, the more you <clears throat> revel and relish sin, the more hardened you become, the more blind you become, the more incapable you become of discerning, hearing, accepting the voice of God, and then you can reach a level. Pay attention to this. Holy Spirit save me from error. You can reach a level of <clears throat> hard hardness that now you reach the point of no return, what the Bible calls reprobate mind, a reprobate mind. When you constantly give in to sin and you constantly justify sin, then it's no longer a choice. It starts out as a choice that you can then, by the Spirit, if you submit to the Spirit, overcome. God knows without the Spirit, you're powerless. But the Spirit comes and convicts you to yield to the Spirit. And the more you yield to the Spirit, the more powerful you are in resisting sin. The more you reject the Spirit, the more you give in to sin, the more powerless you become to overcome sin. And the more you grieve the Holy Spirit, and the more you grieve the Holy Spirit, you then reach a point of reprobation where you now commit what's called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is so hurt and offended and angry and displeased that now he hands you over because that's your punishment. That's reprobation, having a reprobate mind. So why were they not able to see and perceive a Jesus because of their unbelief. What unbelief? They did not believe. They did not understand. They did not <clears throat> want to accept that Jesus, the Messiah, would be killed. Because in their worldview, if he's Messiah, he doesn't get killed. He kills and conquers God's enemies. But when Jesus came and told them that he's not that kind of Messiah, but he will be handed over and he will be beaten, and killed and buried and be raised, their worldview could not allow that and accept it. 
So because of their worldview, because of their tradition, because of what they believed was true, that hindered them from wanting to accept the truth. And because they're unwilling to accept the truth, they were unable then to understand and perceive. Everyone got it? Why would you guys block her? She's saying God can be heard. Yeah, God is effective. I'm going to prove that to you. Are you with me there? Do you understand what the Bible teaches? The more you give in to sin, the harder it will become for you to resist. And the harder it will become for you to then submit to God's will and accept God's truth as it is. Everyone with me? Because I'm going to give you Bible to prove it, but I'm trying to explain it. So why were they unable to see Jesus? Because they did not want to accept and believe that the Messiah would be killed. And it's there in the narrative. You're going to see it like they're shocked. We were hoping he was this the one that would save and redeem Israel. But I guess we were wrong because they did not want to accept this kind of Messiah. Everyone with me there? So let me repeat. The more you give in to sin, the more you resist the Holy Spirit, the more you rebel against the Holy Spirit, the more you succumb to sin, the more you relish sin, you reach a point of reprobation where you've now blasting the spirit and it's over. You're now at the point of no return. Now it's no longer a choice you make, but sin controls you. I'm going to give you the analogy from drug addiction, alcohol addiction. Okay, watch. <clears throat> People who are addicted to drugs or alcohol did not begin addicted to these substances. They began by choosing to drink, choosing to get high, choosing to snort cocaine. But the more they chose, in time, it became less of a choice and now became an addiction where it controls them. That's sin. In the beginning, though you have a sinful proclivity, you still have the spirit working in you and through you to bring you to repentance and energize you to resist sin. But the more you give in to that sin, the more you succumb to that sin, the more you relish in that sin, then it no longer is a choice. It now controls you and you become powerless. Uh, Cruz, if I show you in scripture, there is a point in which you cannot repent. I will send a Shia on your mother. So shut your mouth, go to your vomit and go to hell and let Hamas find you, you piece of garbage. Think you know scripture. Everyone with me there? Did that clear? Everyone got it? Now, where does the Bible teach this? All right, let's go there. Okay, let me show you. Are we ready? All right, let's do this. Why were they unable to see? Well, let's let the Lord says. Let's go through scripture. Because of their unwillingness to accept God's truth, unwillingness to submit God's truth and accept the standard because they think they know better, right? And they think they're wiser than God's will. Here, let's begin. Ready? Matthew 19, 7 to 8. LP, we're going to get you out of here if you don't shut up. Okay. Shut your mouth or I'm going to get you out of here, LP. L -E -P. Shut your mouth. Matthew 19, 7 to 8. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce? Now watch and send her away. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, this destroys Calvinism. It shows you Calvinism is from the pit of hell. Because the Bible doesn't teach that you're born dead in sin and capable of choosing God, or God has chosen to reprobate some to hell. The Bible teaches, though, that you have a sinful proclivity. You're not so dead in sin that you cannot respond to the will of God by the Spirit convicting you. But the more you resist, the more you harden yourself, the dangerous it becomes because then you reach a level of reprobation. You cannot turn back and you grieve the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit hands you over. So notice why God gave them a certificate of divorce. The hardness of your heart. You were so hardened in your sin and rebellion. God in his mercy had to stoop down to your level, meet you where you're at, and allow things that he himself dislikes. You want me there? You 
You with me there? You see it. Because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. Here, the Lord said it. Because you were so dead in your sin, so stuck on your sin, so rebellious, that God either would have to wipe you out or in his love and compassion, humble himself to your level to meet you where you're at and wait patiently to then strengthen you and take you to our level. You see it? Okay, that's one. Continue. Watch here. Mark 3, verses 1 to 5. This shows you Calvinism from a pit of hell. Because if you believe Calvinist, God already predestined them for reprobation. And already they were born dead in sin and hearts hardened. Demate me whether the Shia raped your mother. Get the ladder, you piece of garbage. Mark 3, verses 1 to 5. And he entered again into a synagogue. Mark 3, verses 1 to 5. And a man was there with a withered hand. Now pay attention, brethren. Holy Spirit, rebuke these dogs and help me to crush them and humiliate them for the glory of Jesus Christ. And they were watching him to see if it healed them on the Sabbath. Did you see? Here's a great example of people refusing to submit to God's will, God's standard, God's wisdom and salvation because they already concluded what God can be and cannot be, what God can do and cannot do. And they already assume what the truth is, so that if anything goes against their wisdom, it cannot be true. They cannot accept it, so they resist it. So here's Jesus healing on the Sabbath, and his enemies want to see. Is he going to do work on the Sabbath? You see the mindset. Instead of submitting to God and asking God to show them the truth and being willing to correct and repent of any falsehood, they've already made up their mind. This is what God is. God can't be this way. This is salvation. It can't be any other way. So if anything contradicts what we think is right, it cannot be of God. Okay, are we paying attention? So there, his enemies are watching. Wait, wait, wait. Is he going to do work on Sabbath? Instead of seeing, wow, he's making people hold miraculously, healing them, showing that God is with him, and exemplifying the true spirit of the Sabbath. You see? Okay. And they were watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. Now watch. And he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? So now he's exposing them. You hypocrites, you who think you're religious and you know the law. And you think you know better than me. And because you think you know what is right, you stand in opposition to me. Is it better to heal and save a life on the Sabbath? Or to allow someone to die. Go ahead, hypocrites. Exemplify the spirit of the Sabbath. But they said nothing. And this is where he becomes angry. But they kept silent. And after looking around them with anger, grieved, hurt at their hardness of heart. There's the key. Everyone catching it? If you understand these passages in the exegesis, as the Spirit enables me to do so, this destroys Calvinism. It exposes these false teachers, Jamila Muhammad White and Tony Dodgers. Why is Jesus grieved over the fact that they're hardening their hearts? Shut your mouth, Lisa. Go to hell, meaning book your flight to the Valley of Hanam, and may Hamas find you. Shut your mouth, you Jezebel. The Lord rebuke you. Do not contact me. There you go. Sorry. All right. The demons, Jezebel, thinks she's pious. The Lord rebuked these Jezebels and these arrogant dogs, and the Lord crushed our flesh and give me the power to practice what I preach. Okay, now. Now that's what you get. Now shut your mouth. Anyway, if Calvinism is true, then they're already born dead in sin, enslaved to sin, and their hearts are already hard. And God has already determined who he will reprobate, reprobate to destruction. So why is Jesus grieved, hurt, angered, disappointed at the hardness of their heart? Because Calvinism is alive from the pit of hell. 
Get it? Jesus is grieved. He would only be grieved if his desire was their hearts wouldn't be hardened, but they would submit to the convicting work of the Spirit, working through the Son to repent. You understanding why Calvinism is alive from the pit of hell? You catching it? Everyone? Here it is. Grieved at the hardness of heart. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched out his hand, stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Are you catching it? Understand why they were unable to perceive this was Jesus? Because of their disbelief, because of their unbelief, because of their own wisdom, and thinking God can't be like this. God can't do things this way. So what's the lesson? I got a lot more. The lesson is, if you already think you know how God will act in salvation or what God is like, then when God shows up in a manner contrary to the way you think God will act, then your response is resistance and rejection. This is why they're having a hard time with Jesus. They're not expecting this kind of Messiah. And because of their own traditions, their own wisdom, and because of love of pleasure, they were unable to perceive who Jesus was and the wisdom of God in saving them through the cross, not because God predestined them for that, but because of their own stubborn, hardened, sinful, rebellious hearts. Everyone got it? Everyone got it? Don't forget, he was grieved at their hardness of heart. Grieved at the hardness of their heart. Well, why would Jesus be grieved if he didn't desire that they would believe and repent so he could save them, so that he did desire their salvation? Because Calvinism is alive from the pit of hell. I got to make these points clear. Okay, now let's go to other passages, not only one. Mark 8, 14 and 21. Here's why the disciples couldn't figure it out. So bear with me because I got to impact this. Because you're going to see when they recognize Jesus. When they recognize Jesus. Mark 8, 14 to 21. And they had forgotten to take bread because Jesus had just multiplied bread. He did a second miracle. First miracle, he fed 5,000. Second one, 4,000. Okay, pay attention. May God save us from putting God in a box and assuming what the truth is. And I'm going to share that with my own experience. Why the Lord did not allow me to see the fullness of the truth. And when he did allow me to see it. I'll use me as an example. Just pay attention. I need you to focus. There's a lot to discuss. I got three hours of teaching. If the Lord's pleased to use me. And they had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving orders to them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven. Now he's talking about spiritual leaven. You see how every physical act, physical miracle points to spiritual truth. Jesus's physical miracles are meant to point to spiritual truths. So leaven points to the leaven of sin and false teaching. That if you don't check it, it will spread and corrupt you. Because leaven yeast spreads. Little leaven yeast spreads. So what Jesus is saying, if you have a little spiritual leaven, a little sin that you don't check, or a little false teaching you don't check, then that will corrupt and spread until it destroys your fellowship. So he's warning them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. But they don't understand. And the leaven of, of Herod. And they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. Now watch, and Jesus, where of this said to him, uh, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Here, here's why they're not able to get it. Do you not yet perceive or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Now again, I'm killing several stones, several birds with one stone, the almighty stone, who is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch here. Do you have a hardened heart? If Calvinism is true, they're already dead in sin, hardened in sin, and capable of 
believing the Lord. And if Calvinism is true, Tulip is true, the Lord has already reprobated people. So some he's chosen to destroy and never give them the grace of salvation. But the elect will be illuminated. Well, here you see the Lord is angry and upset that they're not getting it. Do you not yet perceive, understand? Do you have a hard heart? Are you hardening yourself? But hold on, Lord, according to Jamila White and his girlfriend, Antonia Dodgers, they're already born dead in sin and capable of perceiving. You see why God saved me from Calvinism? These passages destroy Calvinism. The Lord expects them to understand. And the Lord is disappointed that they are hardening their hearts. So why don't they get it? Not because the Spirit is not working through Christ to convict them. It's because of their worldview, their mindset. They've been taught a certain way. They've been told certain things that conflicts with the teaching of Jesus. So Jesus is revolutionizing their mindset. He's turning their world upside down because they were not taught to expect such a figure, this kind of Messiah. The same response you get from Muslims, Orthodox Jews, and heretics when you present the Trinity and that God became man and the God man died. Same reaction because their worldview will not allow for this to be true. You catch it? So does the Lord expect them to get it? Yes. Is he angry when they don't? Yes. Well, if Calvinism is true, they're dead in sin. They can't get it. So why is the Lord upset? Because Calvinism is from the pit of hell. It makes the Lord duplicitous. God forbid such blasphemy. Thank you, Lord, for saving me out of Calvinism. Amen, Lori. But now let's continue. He expects them to get it, and he's angry with them. Why aren't you getting it? Because of your worldview, because of your assumptions. You understand what the Lord's saying? Your assumptions, your upbringing, your traditions can be used of sin and Satan to hinder you from submitting to God's word. It's not that the unbelievers don't get the biblical basis for the Trinity. They can't accept it. They refuse to because it contradicts their understanding. And the more you resist the truth plainly revealed to you, the more hardened you become, and then you reach a level of reprobation, it's over. But only the Holy Spirit knows that when it's over for you. Having eyes, do you not see? But wait, Lord, according to Jamila White and his girlfriend, Antonia, they can't see. They're born dead in sin. Having ears, do you not hear? Does this make sense if Calvinism is true? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up. What are you talking about physical bread for? And that's not what I'm talking about. Don't you remember all the leftover bread? I can multiply bread and make bread appear. That's not what I'm talking about. Now watch. They said to him, 12. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? Do you see how easy it is to destroy Calvinism, Mark, if you understand Scripture? Remember this. So you're killing several birds with one stone, this almighty stone of Father, Son, and Spirit, and the perfect word. May the Spirit give us perfect exegesis. So you see why they're not able to perceive this is Jesus. They're not able to understand this is Jesus. They're not able to accept this is Jesus. Not because God blinded them. God forbid such blasphemy. Not because God hardened them. It's because of their sin. They were prevented from recognizing Jesus. Right? So let's continue some more examples. Mark 16, verses 9 to 14. Mark 16, verses 9 to 14. So I got to unpack this, guys. Mark 16, verses 9 to 14. Please pay attention. Now, after he risen early... On the first day of the week, Mark 16, verses 9 to 14. He first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. That's in Luke 8, verse 1 to 3. She went out and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and crying. Now watch this verse. This is the key to unlocking Luke 24. This is the key to unlocking Luke 24. God bless you, Gigi. The key to unlocking Luke 24. Got to pay attention. 
And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. That's the key. They will not believe. And it's their unbelief that's hindering them to realize Jesus is in their midst. You're going to see how it ties in with the Eucharistic presence. You'll see where I'm going with this. Okay, watch here. Now watch the rest of it. Are you ready? Watch here. So they would not believe. And because of that, the Lord is angry with them. After that, he appeared in different form to two of them. You see why I say this connects with Luke 24. This is the two on the road to Emmaus. Here it is. While they were walking along their way to the countryside. And they went away and reported to the others, but they did not believe them either. So the second group, they didn't believe. Watch the pattern. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he reproached them. He rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. You see the key? Why they didn't recognize him at first? You see it? So why are they unable to perceive, understand? Because they refuse to submit to the revelation of God, to the truth of God, and accept God as he is and plan of salvation. No, it doesn't make sense. No, I can't believe it. He died. What do you mean he, he's been raised? Yeah, but he told us. Okay, here it is again. Mark 16, 14. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. And he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. But if Calvinism is true, they're already born dead in sin, hardened already, and capable of believing. So why is he angry with them? Why is he rebuking them for something they have no control over if Calvinism is true? Do you see why you need to pray that God will use you to destroy the satanic system called Tulip? It's from the pit of hell. Because it makes mockery of these passages. Lord, why are you angry? Over their unbelief and hardened hearts. According to John Calvin and his followers, they're already born dead and sin hardened. They cannot perceive and believe unless you regenerate them. So why are you angry over the fact you didn't regenerate them and enable them to understand? You see, they make the Lord look like he's duplic duplicitous, capricious, and wicked and dishonest. God forbid such blasphemy. Okay? So they could not perceive. Not because they didn't have that ability. Yes, you're born with a sinful proclivity, but sin hasn't swallowed you up. You still have the Holy Spirit convicting you with the law written in your heart because you bear the image of God to submit to the Spirit, not to sin. The more you resist the Spirit, the more you give in to sin, that's when it becomes dangerous. Let me repeat. The more you resist the Spirit, the more you give in to sin, that's when it becomes dangerous. See what the teaching is? That's biblical teaching, biblical anthropology, right? And he reproached them for their unbelief in Arnold's heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. So do you see why the two on the road of Emmaus did not understand, perceive it was Jesus? Not because Jesus was lying to them, hiding from them, because their sin of not believing what he said when he was in their midst hindered them from recognizing their Lord. Sin will hinder you from recognizing your Lord. So far, we got it. A few more. Here, Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. What does Paul say about the Gentiles? Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. We'll read Ephesians 4, 17 to 25. But now watch. Then we're going to continue. The Eucharistic presence. Therefore, this I say and testify in the Lord. Ephesians 4, 17, 19. We're going to read Ephesians 4, 17 to 25. Exactly, Sonia, you got it. And I'm going to explain to you practically what that means. Therefore, this I say and testify in the Lord, that you, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, and their futility of their mind, and their foolish thinking, thinking they're wise, but they're stupid, being darkened in their mind, their minds darkened by their foolish way of life and their philosophies that are not based on revelation but on the fallen imperfect finite thoughts of sinful minds 
alienated from the life of God. Because why? Of their ignorance, the ignorance that is in them. Not because God hardened them and they're dead in sin. Because of the hardness of their heart. Thinking they are wise, they are smart. Thinking they know better. The wisdom of the wise, the philosophers, Plato, Socrates. Thinking they understand life. They understand the way, the path to immortality. And scoffing at anything that disagrees with their futile thinking. That's why. And they, having become callous, they became callous. Notice, they were not born callous. They became callous. Because the more you refuse to submit to the light of God's revelation, the more you submit to your own thinking, traditions, and sin, the more callous you become. Have given themselves over. Not that God did it. God hands you over to the desires of your heart. So God will give you what you want. He'll hand you over. That's what you want? Here you go. That's Romans 1. Over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Okay, now watch. Guys, help me to help you. Don't preach. Let the Lord work through me. Now watch here. Ephesians 4, 17 to 25. Watch here. But you did not learn Christ in this way. See, when we taught you Jesus, you learned that the wisdom of God revealed in Christ is different from that of the world. And the revelation that Christ has brought teaches you to say no to sin, to die to sin, to hate immorality, lawlessness, and greed. If indeed you heard him and were taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus. So what he's saying to the Greeks is, the truth is not in Socrates or in Plato. They had nuggets of truth because of the illumination given to them, but they butchered and mixed and perverted that truth with their falsehoods, their futile way of thinking. You want the pure truth? It's in Jesus. To lay aside and reference your former conduct, the old man, the old you, which is being corrupt in accordance with lots of deceit. That was your old you. You agreed with the world. And you did what the world said was okay. You called good evil and evil good because of the world. Okay? And to be renewed. But Jesus came to renew you in the spirit of your mind. To change the way you think and feel. Your attitude. Now you see things the way God sees things. And I'll explain what I mean. To put on the new man. You've been transformed to be a new creation. New <clears throat> mind. Renewed. A new heart. A new attitude. A different perspective on life being renewed in the likeness of god you're reflecting god you're acting like god you're behaving like god you're being recreated in righteousness and holiness of the truth because the truth of christ tells you think god's thoughts after him and behave the way god wants you to behave and behave the way god is if he's holy you're holy what he calls sin you call sin Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speaking truth, each one of you with his neighbor. Tell your neighbors the truth. Don't tickle their ears. No interfaith dialogue. For we are members of one another. You see how beautiful your Bible is? How rich and deep the Bible is? And may the Spirit illuminate me to plunge deeper and deeper so I can understand and obey and live out the truth and teach it to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now let me explain what he means. Before you were convicted and converted and submitted to the Spirit, you lived in the world, acted like the world, and you revel, relished in the world. So, like the world, you said abortion is pro-choice. Like the world, you said having sex before marriage is fine. Like the world, saying to have orgies or to do what they call, what is that, spouse? What uh, Swindlers, is that what they call them? What the world said was okay, you agreed with, and you condemned those who oppose the world. Now in Christ, abortion is murder. Now in Christ, sex before marriage is immoral. Now in Christ, no multiple sexual partners, no sex outside of your own marriage, because that's adultery. Now in Christ, no cheating people, no using people, no robbing people, because you now see the world through the eyes of Christ. Because you've been changed. Yes, yeah, swingers. 
No more hedonistic lifestyle, going to nightclubs and bars and just gyrating your hips and getting drunk and getting high. and None of that. See, that's what the Bible teaches. It's hard. I don't have the gift of celibacy. It's hard. They yeah, open marriages, swingers. I know. This is why I don't trust in myself. Never trust in you, but cry out to the Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, own me. I give you my life completely. I'm your possession. You save me from myself. Exactly, Tony. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the world goes from bad to worse until the Lord comes and transforms it. Okay, everyone got it? So are we understanding why people are unable to perceive Christ and accept Christ and discern Christ? Not because they're dead in sin, hardened from conception or reprobated by God, because the more they give in to their desires, their lusts, their thinking, their traditions, the more they submit to the world's wisdom, the wisdom of the world, the more they become incapable of discerning God's wisdom and accepting God as he is. So God will give you the desires of your heart. What do I mean? I'm going to give you a true story. You guys okay with this? You're going nowhere, right? Let's go into meat by the power of the Holy Spirit. Even though I look old and dull and heavy. May the Lord help me to get lose the weight. Even though large is loose on me, I don't get it, man, why I look heavy. Lord, heal my mind. Beatify us with the beauty of Jesus Christ. Okay. I'm going to give you a true story of how the Lord works. True story of how the Lord works. I read in a Jehovah Witness magazine. Watch how we prove the Bible's 100% true. Because the Bible is God's word. God knows creation better than creation knows itself. We end up proving the Bible day in and day out. No one has falsified what the Bible says of the world. The world keeps proving the Bible is absolutely true. And I'm going to give you an example. A testimony of a Jewish woman. And I had read her testimony in sessions that I did three years ago. Don't ask me which session. I don't know. But if you watch my other sessions, I mention her because I read it from one of their magazines. Because Joe's Witnesses produced two magazines, Watchtower and Awake. So this young Jewish woman. Raised by a single Jewish mom in Israel with Orthodox Jewish influence. She decided to start reading about Christianity, Jesus, in the library. Now, notice what I'm about to say in regards to testimony. She concluded Jesus can't be God, right, because he's a man, and God can't be the Trinity. She couldn't accept that. Now, notice she's already telling God what he can and cannot be. I could not believe Jesus is God or God is a trinity. This is part of her testimony. So she's already telling God what he can and cannot be. So she's telling God, I will accept you if you're not triune God, and I'll accept Jesus if he's not God in the flesh. God says, okay. So guess what happens? Who knocks on her door? Joe's witnesses. And what do they teach? God is not the trinity. Jesus is not God. And then she became a Joe witness. See that? This illustrates what Jesus is teaching. This illustrates the teaching of Jesus. If you've already told God what he can and cannot be, what he can and cannot do, then you will not be able to accept and receive the true God as he is and the plan of salvation. Same thing with Muslims, same thing with Orthodox Jews. You get my point? You understand where I'm getting at? Had she humbled herself and said, God, I don't know who you are. I don't know if Jesus is God, but I'm willing and open to accept you as you are. And if Jesus is God, I'll accept it. Then the Lord would have given her the truth. And that's the testimony of many people. And there are even times in which people did not look for the truth. They found it anyway, like Paul. You get my point? Let me use me as an illustration. I'm going to use me as an illustration. Then we're going to go to Luke 24. Because you're going to see how deep this is. Are you ready? 
I'm going to use myself as an illustration. When I became a staunch Calvinist, anti-Catholic, I could not accept and entertain the possibility of, let's say, purgatory or the Eucharist being the flesh and blood of Christ or communion of saints or Mary being a perpetual virgin. So guess what? Because I could not accept it, the Lord allowed me to plunge in my own thinking and the thinking of others that I admired. And I thought I was wise to refute these truths. I even wrote articles why the mass cannot be the body and blood of Christ or why Mary could not be a perpetual virginity, per perpetual virgin. Now, I've deleted those articles since then. So when God saw that I will not accept the truth unless the truth agrees with my assumptions, then the Lord just patiently allowed me to plunge in my stupidity. But when the Lord in his mercy allowed me to see the debates between Jamila White and the Catholics and hear the Catholic responses, Orthodox, and I kept looking at the early church fathers and the church writers, and I kept looking at the promise of Scripture, the more my heart became softened, the more I became <clears throat> willing to swallow my pride, the more I cried out to the Spirit, and I told the spirit, I will accept the truth, whatever it is, as long as you guide me. Once I did that, everything became clear to me. Now everything fit in. And now it made sense. Once I opened myself and said, all right, if it's true, it's true, I'll accept it. Once I humbled myself before the spirit convicting me, then now it made sense. Oh, wow. Wow. Now I get it. Can I give you two examples that before I opened myself, I thought these were good arguments. But then when I humbled myself, I see how stupid they are. And now I see the wisdom in God doing things the way he did. Are you ready? Can I give you two arguments just to show you? This is all preparing you for Luke 24. I hope you don't mind. The difference between telling God what he can and cannot be and the Lord handing you over to your own futile thinking, thinking you're wise in your own mind and humbling yourself before the Lord and then opening your mind. All right. Here, here's my, my first thing. Let's take Mary and Joseph. Why in the world would Joseph and Mary be engaged to get married if God didn't plan for Joseph to consummate marriage with Mary? Obviously, because in marriage, you have conjugal rights. That's how I thought. But once I humbled myself, now it made sense. Look at the perfect wisdom of our God. Why did the Lord wait until Mary was engaged to be married? Even though Joseph and Mary would not consummate marriage, which was the virtual unanimous testimony of the church from the disciples of the apostles onwards. Don't let these Protestants deceive you. Even Martin Luther affirmed Mary's perpetual virginity. Even John Calvin scoffed at those who would use Matthew 125 to deny Mary's perpetual virginity. Okay, now are you ready? Now let me show you the beautiful wisdom. Why God, in his love and compassion, only intervened to cause Mary to conceive by the Spirit when she's about to get married. Can you imagine in that culture, Mary getting pregnant, Joseph abandoning her, or Mary getting pregnant without being engaged, giving birth to a child as a single mother in that culture, how far do you think she would have gotten in life? How far do you think she would have gotten in life in that culture? A woman not engaged to be married and pregnant and gives birth. But you see the beautiful wisdom and care and love for God, love of God for the Blessed Mother. He made sure she would only conceive when she gets pregnant. In order that Joseph would take her into his home so that now people would not accuse her of fornicating or committing adultery and then be stigmatized and marginalized so that Jesus could not be raised in an environment where he could function among others because people would be mocking him and his single mother. But now by Joseph bringing her into the home, he was now acting as a guardian to protect her and Jesus from stigma and being marginalized 
and giving them a normal upbringing. You see the wisdom of God? In other words, the most perfect way of doing it is the way the Lord did it. There would have been no better way for Mary to give birth to Jesus as a virgin and remain a virgin without being stigmatized and marginalized than the way the Lord allowed it to be done. Because now Joseph will bring her to the house. People are going to think, oh, this is the child of Joseph and Mary. Oh, so Joseph, by marrying her, proves that she didn't commit adultery. She's a good woman, so Jesus can function normally in society. But when did this dawn on me? When I submitted and yielded to the Spirit. I'm not lying to you. This is how the Spirit works in me. When I ask the Spirit for wisdom, I start meditating on what the Bible says. And in my meditation, the Spirit illuminates me. All glory to the Holy Spirit. May we be perfectly in love with Him and cling to Him. You see how perfect it is? There would have been no better situation, circumstance than the one in which Mary found herself. Now, Jim, did the Shia save your mother after doing muta with her and giving her a bath? Everyone got it? Now, let me give you another example. The Eucharist, which I deleted the post when I thought I was smart. And I'm going to go back to my... This is all preparing for Luke 24. Look how smart I thought I was. Aha! Look how smart I thought I was. If you tell me that the bread and cup is the flesh and blood of Christ, Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Matthew 26, 26 to 28. You can read all the way to 29. Matthew 26, 26 to 29. Okay, now pay attention, Ecclesiastes. I'll get there in a minute. Mark 14, 22 to 25. Luke 22, 14 to 20. The Lord's Supper. Here's the genius Sam. Say, I'm going to destroy you Catholics and Orthodox. Jesus says, take this as my body broken for you. Take this cup, which is my blood of the new covenant, shed for the forgiveness of the sins of many. Then I say, oh, wait, wait, wait. Are you telling me that became the flesh and blood of Christ? Yeah. Oh, now I got you. Because Jesus says, I tell you the truth. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again. Until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of God. So Jesus said he drank the cup and he'll drink it again in the kingdom when Christ brings the kingdom to the world. Now look at me, genius. Jamil Muhammad White Wannabe. So you're telling me Jesus ate his flesh and drank his blood. Why? He's sinless. See, I got you. And you're telling me in the new heaven, new earth, when God's kingdom is established, they're going to continue to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ. Why? They're sinless. See, I destroyed you. And sadly, the Lord forgive me, I stumped some Catholics on that. But you want me to tell you how stupid I am and how to refute that? You want me to show you how to refute that and destroy that objection now that I humbled myself to accept the fact the Eucharist is the flesh and blood of Christ? You want me to destroy that argument? You guys ready? I thought it was good. Now, if I was a Protestant, I probably shook some of you. Damn. Yeah, why would Jesus eat his flesh and drink his blood? He's sinless. And why is he eating his own flesh and drinking his own blood? And why are they going to continue to eat his flesh and drink his blood in new heaven, new earth, when the king established on earth? They're sinless. Damn, you got us, Sam. Nope. No, stupid. So here's how I would refute the old Sam. If the old Sam was standing, that fatter Sam, that bulkier Sam, hopefully this Sam is leaner and more handsome, I'd say, hold on, Sam. You're telling me Jesus is unable to ensure that when he eats the bread and drinks the cup, that he wouldn't make it his flesh and blood when he partakes of it? Jesus is not able to do that? What do you mean? Yes, it becomes his flesh and blood when they eat and drink it. But when he eats and drinks it, he doesn't have to make it his own flesh and blood. He can prevent that from happening when he eats it. That's number one. Number two, who told you that in the new heaven, new earth, that Jesus will continue making the bread and the cup, his flesh and blood, 
Now it's his flesh and blood because we need it. Then it won't need to be. You just got busted, Sam. That's what you think. That's what you get for thinking you're smart, idiot. See? See how simple that was? See how simple that was? Did you understand the rebuttal? But do you believe it that when I was hardened against the Eucharist being the flesh and blood of Christ, I thought my argument was a knockout, irrefutable. But then God, in his mercy, waited patiently. When I humbled myself, he shows me how stupid I was. That's why I say be careful. Be careful. Because you may think you're smarter and more wise than you are, and that will be a path to destruction and the Lord humiliating you. Always ask the Spirit. And I ask the Spirit and pray for me. Destroy our pride, our arrogance, and fake piety, and teach us to truly be humble and do not hand us over to discipline. You see? But when did it dawn on me this was a stupid argument? When I humbled myself. All right. Eucharist is the flesh and blood of Christ. That's what they taught. I accept it. Okay. Does it make sense now? You see how God works? He will reward your humbleness. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and he'll exalt you. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourself and God will exalt you. Exalt yourself and God will humble you. Matthew 23, 12. You see how it works? He will reward your humility. If you tell the Lord, Lord, I don't know anything and I don't. I'm stupid. Please save me from being arrogant and puffed up. Destroy me from fake piety. And that I think I'm wiser than I am. And do not hand me over. I will accept you as you are and your truth as it is. I mean it, Lord. That's the kind of prayer God delights in. And he will reward you with wisdom. Why do you think ever since I've opened myself to the truth, my ministry has blown up like never before. I've become world famous, not because I'm looking for that. May God save me from that. And in spite of me cussing out people, insulting them like never before, I keep growing. I've never grown this much in my life in ministry. And yet I will cuss you out and swear. I cuss out. I swear more than ever before. I curse people more than ever before. And I keep growing. See? And who is the Lord rebuking, exposing, shaming, humiliating? Look at it. Go look at Antonio Dodgers, that fat cow. He's barely making it. He's become a joke. Quoting forgeries. Only his fangirls support him. Or Jamila Muhammad White. Even Calvinists can't stand him. May God save us from that. Everyone got it? Now, does it make sense? Those are bad arguments. Did you see? Did you guys see why those are bad arguments? Do I need to repeat it one more time before we go to Luke 24? Do you see how you refute that? No, Jesus did not eat his flesh and blood. Why? Because the almighty Jesus, the almighty son, can prevent the bread and cup from being his flesh and blood when he eats and drinks. But he can then make that bread and cup, the flesh and blood, for his disciples to eat and drink. And in the age to come, he doesn't have to make the bread and cup his flesh and blood anymore, but he does it now for our healing and nourishment and salvation. Dependable, no one gives a damn what you think. You're a bastard whore, son of the devil, so get out of here. No one asks for your opinion. Don't be that stupid and arrogant to give your opinion. We think you're a piece of garbage, so go back to your vomit. Don't come here and pontificate. Did that help? So I can now go, now go back to Luke 24. Do you see what's happening in Luke 24? Why don't they perceive Jesus? Because of their hardened hearts, because of their sinfulness and refusing to accept God as he is in the plan of salvation, their sin hindered them from realizing it's Jesus. Is that clear? Did it make sense so I can move on? Don't ask me these questions, glory to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. If you're in Saudi Arabia, and you don't have a priest who can come secretly to give you the Eucharist, then pray the Lord 
Say, Lord, you know our circumstances. You know we're in Saudi Arabia, we'll be killed. But we want the flesh and blood of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. So then you can ask the Lord, Lord, here's the bread, here's the wine. We ask by your spirit, make this the flesh and blood of Christ to us because of our circumstances. And because Christ is a God of infinite compassion, trust him. He will honor that. He knows your circumstances. Okay, with me there? Everyone got it? Crystals, everyone, is it clear how to refute that nonsense? Before I move on, Nina, everyone, those are bad arguments that I thought they were good. All right, now let's go back to Luke 24. Now let's unpack it because now I'm going to shock you. More proof the Eucharist is the physical bodily presence of our Lord, that his flesh and blood is given to us in the Eucharist. Watch, more proof. Oh, in fact, here's another one. Luke 24, verses 1 to 12. Again, in that very chapter... They show their unbelief. Here, Luke 24, verses 1 to 12. Let me set it up. Watch here. Jonathan, focus on the session, not me. Now, Luke 24, verses 1 to 12. This is setting up why they didn't recognize him. Watch, you're going to be mind blown. Even though I've done the same session on Luke 24 almost a year earlier. Now, on the first day of the week at early dawn, now catch... The Lord's Day Sunday and Eucharist celebration. Please pay attention. This is the first day. This is Sunday. Sunday. Now on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of Lord Jesus. Pay attention. They could not find the body because he's risen. He now raised that physical body from the virgin, glorified that body. And it happened that while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And when the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? The living one among the dead. Now watch. Watch here again, proving my point, that if you are hardened in your unbelief and your futile way of thinking, you're not going to recognize Jesus. Here. He's not here, but he has risen. He's not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. So don't you remember? Did he tell you this? Why are you expecting to find his body? You see, didn't you believe? He said on the third day he'd be raised. So why are you shocked? The tomb is empty. The body's gone. And they remembered his words. Now, wow, yeah, he told us. But we didn't understand because we couldn't believe it. And when they returned from the tomb, they reported all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Now, remember, they, they were told. Jesus prophesied this. But instead of eagerly awaiting for him to appear, on the third day after being raised, look at their response. Now, Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the rest of the one with, with them were there. They were telling these things to the apostles. Now watch. But these words appear to them as nonsense. You catch it? That's why they could not perceive the Lord. Nonsense. Even though he told them. Wait, didn't he tell you? Yeah. Nonsense. And they were not believing that's why they couldn't perceive, because they refused to believe. It's not that he wasn't clear. They're going to kill me. Son of man, I'll be raised on the third day. What? No way. But Peter stood up and ran to the tomb and stooped to look in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away by himself, marveling at what happened. And he still doesn't get it. He still doesn't get it. Man. It's the third day. The tomb is empty. The body's gone. And he had told us that he would be killed and be raised. And he still doesn't get it. Why? Because his worldview will not accept a Messiah who will be killed, buried, and be raised. In fact, let me show you what Luke says about that earlier on. Okay, watch here. Watch here. You ready? 
You see how beautiful the Bible is? It has all the answers. You may not like the answers, but it's there. Here, watch here. Earlier, before he died, so are you seeing why they are not getting it? Why they're hardened? Because their worldview, their assumptions, their traditions, their lifestyle will not allow them for God to be who he is and for God to act the way he wants. No way. God can't be triune. Jesus can't be God in the flesh. God cannot die on the cross. Stupid, silly. Oh, really? All right. No way. Aborting babies, murdering babies is not sin. It's pro-choice. It's my body. Having sex with... No, you see? Oh, really? Okay. Luke 18, 31 to 34. Luke 18, 31 to 34. But when he took the 12 aside, Luke 18, 31, 34, he said to them, behold, see, he's making it plain as day. We are going up to Jerusalem. We're getting near. And all the things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be completed. Everything written about me. It's going to happen, guys. Get ready. Like what, Jesus? For he'll be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have flogged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Now, how hard is that? Even a kid can understand what he's saying. You're going to be killed? You? And you're going to rise again? But now notice 34. But the disciples understood none of these things. It's not they couldn't understand the words. Plainly, you're telling us you're going to be killed and be raised. They couldn't comprehend how could this be true. How in the world can you be killed? You're the Messiah, the anointed king of Israel, the son of God. You conquer God's enemies. What is going on here? Their worldview will not allow God to be who he is. Yes, JC, you got it. And this statement was hidden from them. Now, who hid it from them? Not God, their own unbelief and disbelief and sin. And they did not comprehend the things that were said. Their unwillingness to accept God as he is and the way he would save hindered them. And they couldn't make sense out of it. Right? Now we got the context. Now I can move on. When will you recognize Jesus? Now Catholics, Orthodox, you're going to get blown away if you're listening. Now let's continue. Okay. Okay, so let's continue. We're going to read Luke 24, 13 to 35, but watch. Watch here. Look what's going to happen. Look, you see these two, because of their unbelief, are unwilling to accept that Christ is raised from the dead. Luke 24, we're picking it up. <clears throat> picking up at verse 15. But their eyes were, uh, 16, I'm sorry, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you are discussing with one another as you are walking? And they stood still looking sad. Now, remember, it's the third day. They remember the prophecies. And they're even going to say, some of the women told us that they went to the tomb and it was empty and angels appeared to them. So they're even saying the tomb is empty. The body's gone. Angels appeared to the women. And we still don't believe it. That's why they're not recognizing Jesus. And one of them named Cleopas answered said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here these days? You don't know what just took place three days earlier. And he said to them, what thing? What things are you talking about? And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene. So Jesus is asking questions to lead you to repentance and illuminate you to bring out what's in you and to purge you of that that's hindering you from accepting God completely. So he's trying to buy the questions to bring it all out. Bring out all that junk, all that filth. Confess it. Confess it. Acknowledge it. The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a mighty prophet. See? In deed and word, in the sight of God and the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. Now watch. You see why the Lord's doing this? He's asking for them to confess. You see? Confession. Acknowledge, confess, bring it out, let it out so I can purge you. Now watch here. Now watch what's going to happen. Now here's their unbelief, 
Unbelief. Watch their unbelief. You ready? Here's their unbelief. Focus. And then we're going to go Luke 1. We'll finish. But we were hoping. See? Their hopes were dashed. They lost hope. He's not the one after all. He's not the one after all. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Did you catch it? They lost faith in him. We had hoped he would redeem Israel, but now he's killed and buried. We were mistaken. Now watch, though, how they testify against themselves. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But do you remember Jesus told you the third day he'd be raised? So look how they're bearing witness against themselves. Yeah, it's the third day. And on top of that, watch. But also some woman among us astounded us. Why are you astounded? Didn't he tell you? When they were at the tomb early in the morning and not finding his body, they came saying that they also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive and they still don't get it. See, they're bearing witness against themselves. Some of those who were, who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the woman also said, but him they did not see. They just bore witness, testified against themselves. So they're admitting it's the third day. They're admitting the tomb is empty. They're admitting the body's gone. They're admitting the woman saw angels telling them Jesus is alive. And they're admitting that some of them, like Peter, went to the tomb and found it, as they said. And they still don't believe. And they still think that Jesus failed. You see what's preventing them? You see what's preventing them? That sister is a regular. Please don't delete her comments. She's a regular, please. Amen, Matthew. That's my. That's what my goal is. May the Holy Spirit confirm that in me. My goal is to give you a vision, to visualize these events by the power of the Holy Spirit. For the glory of Jesus Christ, not for my praise. You caught it? You see how they just testified against themselves? They're admitting it's the third day. They're admitting the woman saw a vision of angels telling he's alive. And the tomb was empty and the body was gone. They're admitting that some went to confirm the tomb was empty because the body was gone. And the angel said he's alive and they still do not believe. So they're testifying against themselves. So now you wonder why they don't recognize that Jesus. How are you going to recognize your Lord when you refuse to accept his word and accept him as he is. And you continue holding on to your traditions that contradict God's word. And I'm talking about these Protestants. They like to throw stones at Catholic and Orthodox. Sorry for the lag. This is the best we can do. So we're going to have to just do it as long as the audio is good. Don't worry about the lag. Okay, now watch when they recognize Christ. You want to get shocked? When do they recognize Christ? Now Jesus rebukes them. When do they recognize Christ? You're going to get shocked, folks. Yep. When do they recognize Christ? And he said to them, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. He's rebuking them. Foolish you are and so slow in perceiving what the prophets had spoken. You see how deep it is now, guys. You want more proof the Eucharist is the flesh and blood of Christ? Here you go. Was it not necessary? For the Christ to suffer these things to enter his glory. Right? Was it not necessary? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. See here. This is what Moses said about the Messiah. Here, 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 here. You still don't get it? Now watch. Watch. Here's the Eucharist. You get ready? Now, Jesus is about to leave them. Now, here's another message, and it moves me in my heart. It moves me in my heart. Now, please pay attention, folks. Private T-Bone, watch this, my brother. Lord bless you, watch. Here's where, when I read this, it moves me in my heart. 
And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted, and that's a bad translation, not he acted, as though he were going further. Terrible translation. No. Let me give you a better translation. Man, that was a terrible one. Damn. It almost looks like he's deceiving. God forbid such blasphemy. Let me just show you a better translation. Okay? Because I'm going to tell you what he's doing here. All right. Let me find one. This one captures it. Sorry about that, because it almost acts like it's, he's deceiving. No, he's not. He doesn't deceive, but I'll give you the point. Here, let me give you this. Contemporary English version. When the two of them came near the village where they were going, Jesus seemed to be going farther. It appeared that he was going farther. farther. Okay. Now here's one, another one. Be careful of some of the translations. All right. Here's another one. Easy translation. Here it goes. Then they came near to the village that the disciples were going to it. It seemed that Jesus would continue his journey. They, they were given the impression that he was leaving. I'm going to explain to you why. Here, Christian, Holman Christian Standard Bible. All right, let me see. There are good translations, bad ones, but let me explain what the point was. This is where it gets deep. Lord, save me from error and bring out the meat of Scripture. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going further. Now, was he giving the impression because he was deceiving them? No. You know what Jesus is doing here? This is where you're going to see his humbleness. This is where you're going to see his humbleness. The reason why he gave the impression he's walking away is because he will not come uninvited. He will not go to a house that he's not invited to. That's the impression. This is why it moves me in my spirit. What Jesus is saying is, I will not come if I'm not asked. If I'm not invited and you don't welcome me, I will not impose and intrude. See, this is why I'm getting moved in my spirit right now. It wasn't he's lying. The impression he's giving them is, look, I'm continuing further. I'm leaving. Because I will not enter a house that I'm not invited, that I'm not welcomed and asked to come. So this is why this moved me in my spirit. See, this is what he's teaching them. He would have continued going further unless they invited him. So what Jesus is saying is, if you don't invite me, then I won't impose, I won't come to a place that I'm not welcomed. That's what he's doing. See why it's moving in my spirit? So the impression isn't he's lying to them. God forbid, Jesus is the God of truth. The impression is, I'm going to continue going if I'm not welcomed and invited in. You don't invite me, I'm out of here. I'm gone. And so when they saw that, watch here now. Remember, it's the first day. It's Sunday, right? Now watch. Watch here. In other words, he's saying, invite me in and I will live with you. Not only invite him, say, Lord, this is your home. This is your home. As long as I live in this house, it's yours, Lord. You don't need to be invited. It's your home. Yep, that was the next passage I'm going to quote, Revelation 3.20. Wait, what am I going to do with that one? Because it ties in with the Eucharist. Okay? Alan, watch what I'm going to do with Revelation 3.20, what you just mentioned, because it ties in with the Eucharist. Now watch here. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us. Don't go. Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. See? He's saying, will you invite me in? If not, then I'm on my way. Crow, you ask him to come into your life. Your heart is his home. Lord, I invite you in. My heart is your throne. My body is your temple. Own me. That's how. Now watch. Watch here. When do they recognize him? Here's the Eucharist. And then I'm going to tie it in with another passage. Okay, pay attention. We're going to go deep.
Amen. Amen, Lord, have mercy on me. Please, Lord, help us to be doers of your word. Forgive me when I fail. Help me, Lord. Save me from myself. Now watch here. See how humble and beautiful our God is? How humble and beautiful our God is? And it happened that when he had reclined at the table, now watch, when they recognize him, Crystals, Nina, everyone else, watch. He took the bread and blessed it, and after breaking it, he was giving it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. You will recognize Jesus at the Eucharist. That's why when he broke the bread and gave it to them, he disappeared. Why? Because they now had him in the bread. He was now present in the bread. This bread is my body broken for you. So he broke it and he gave it to them as a sign. I am with you physically in the Eucharist. Did you catch it? They recognized him at the breaking of bread, at the giving of the Eucharist. Did you catch it? And so he didn't have to be there physically because now he was with them sacramentally. The bread is his flesh. So he left physically because now he's present with them in the Eucharist, the broken bread. And they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us? While he was speaking to us on the road, while he was opening in the script, opening the scriptures to us, do you see it? Do you caught it? Do you see the Eucharist? When he broke the bread, gave it to them, he disappeared physically. Why? Because he's present with you physically in the Eucharist. So when you have the Eucharist, you have Jesus with you physically. Is it a coincidence? Now let me tie it in. Let me tie it in. And then we're going to go Luke 1. Let me tie it in. Okay, watch here. With this scripture, they're going to go Luke 1. Watch here. All right. Watch here. Revelation 3.20. Revelation 3.20 to tie it in with this. Now watch. Watch what's going to happen. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. And I want you to remember that word, dine, okay? Crystal and you got to listen, dine. If you invite me in, I'll come in and dine with you, eat with you, and you with me. Now, what did he do with them? Look what he did. Luke 24, 28 to 29. Luke 24, 28 to 29. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now ready over. So he went in to stay with them. And what did he do? He dined with them, right? I'm knocking. Open, I will come in and I will eat with you and eat with me. But what is he going to eat with you? What is he going to dine with you? Watch. I want you to catch the verse again. That word dine, sup, in the King James Version, it's used at the Eucharist. It's used for the Eucharist when Jesus has the Passover with them. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine, sup with him and he with me. Now get ready to be blown away. This word, dine, it's used in Luke 22, when Jesus is the Passover, where he then institutes the Eucharist. In other words, he says, if you invite me in, you and I will dine at my table through the Eucharist. The Eucharist. Here, let me prove it to you. So let me show you what the word is. 
Here it is, Revelation. So I'm going to show it to you on my phone. Let's see what the word is. Okay, click on here. Here it is. Revelation 3. Guys, click on it. Right there, please. It's Bible Hub Interlinear. The word dine. Deep nisu. Deep nisu. Let me see if I can show it on the screen. I'm going to show you what it means. Deep nisu. Deep nisu. Yeah, you're the same guy that came under 50,000 accounts. Me and my father. Say it another 10 times so I can send you to Hamas. Deep nisu. Watch here. What does deep nisu mean? Watch here. Let me show it to you. Deep nisu. Let's see the word. You see the word here? Deep nisu. Let's see if you see it. You see it? Deep nisu. Deep nisu. Dine. Okay, let's see what it is. Dine. What does it mean? Deep nisu. It comes from what? Let's see what word. Watch here. It comes from this word right here. Watch here. Okay. Look where it's used. Look where it's used. Here it is right there. Let's see where it's used so you can see. All right. Deep niu. Deep niu, right? Now look where it's used, guys. You ready? Do you see where it's used? It's used in Luke 22, 20, after they had eaten of the bread and the cup, and 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 25, when Paul recounts the Eucharist. You see it? Luke 22, 20. That's when Jesus gives them the bread and the cup as the Eucharist. 1 Corinthians 11, 25. That's when Paul recounts the Eucharist. It's the same word. Do you see it? In other words, Revelation 3.20 is an invitation to the Holy Eucharist. Now let me show you the verses. He's saying, come in. Let me in and come in and feast at my table, partake of the Holy Eucharist. You saw, right? I didn't make it up. Right here. Let me show it to you. Luke 22, 20, 1 Corinthians 11, 25. Let's see the context. So do you see what Luke 24 is all about? It's about the Eucharistic presence of our Lord. Here it is. Let me show you. Here it is. You see it? Let's do this. Let me find a translation that makes sense. Let me see if I can do this one second. One, I'll bring it up. You saw, right? I didn't make it up. Just give me a second. Then we're going to go into Luke 1 and we'll be done. And then, Lord, Lord willing, later on, I may be with God's logic. Okay. Here you go. Luke 22, 19, 20. New International Version. And he took bread, gave thanks... And broke it, Luke 22, 19 to 20. And gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this and run to me now. In the same way, after the supper, that's the same word. Deep niu, deep nisu, supper, that's the word. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do You see what Jesus is inviting people to? A rebellious church is about to be cut off. Turn, invite me back in because your sin, right? I've turned my face on you. But if you invite me back in and repent, you will feast at the Lord's table and partake of the Holy Eucharist. Here it is now. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. Pay attention to 25. And then go to Luke 1. If you want me to, if you're tired, I'll stop. Luke 11, 23. To 26, watch. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now here it is, 25. In the same way, after supper, that's the word, dipniu, where we get the word dipnisu in Revelation 3.20. I knock at the door. He invites me in. I will eat with him, sup with him, and he with me. How the Lord dine with you? At the Eucharist. In other words, Jesus is saying, when you come to the Eucharist, you are feasting with me. Because at the Eucharist, I'm physically present and giving myself physically to you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Did that make sense, everyone? Did you get it? Did you get it or no? Focus before I start blocking people. Because now we're going to go to Luke 1. All right, Luke 1. And we're going to continue Christmas in Luke 1 and 2. But it's going to be a part 3 on Luke 1. I'm just going to touch Luke 1, 26 to 35. Now, I have discussed this before. I've done Luke 24, showing how you will recognize Christ at the Eucharist. This is my second time addressing Luke 24. I hope it's clearer now, and it gets clearer and clearer. But for those of you who didn't hear me discuss this in the previous session, how many of you were shocked to discover the depth of Luke 24, how it points to the bread communicating the physical bodily presence of Christ so that when the Eucharist is with you, Christ is with you physically, which is why when he broke the bread, he disappeared. Because he was leaving them, his flesh, through the Eucharist, the sacrament of the bread. How many of you were shocked to discover this? How many of you? Some Protestants don't take, they don't believe the Eucharist is the flesh and blood of Christ. Everyone got it? All right. And this was something the Spirit granted to me to see as I meditated on the passages and made the connections with Revelation 3.20. So glory to the Father and the Spirit. All right, now let's go to Luke 1 and let's wrap it up. I'm going to show you who the Blessed Mother is according to Gabriel. Luke 1, 26 to 35. But now pay attention because I'm going to do a part three on Christmas, the baby in the manger, Lord willing. Because I said I was going to do it today. And Lord willing, later today, I may be with God's logic. We had over 2,000. We had about close to 2,000 on his YouTube. All together on TikTok, there was over 3,500 people. May the numbers increase for the glory of the Lord, not for our praise. Now here, let's break it down. Luke 1, 26 to 35. Lord bless you, Jenny. Okay, watch here. Luke 1, 26 to 35. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Now, if you highlight your Bible, highlight Galilee. Galilee. Highlight Galilee. Okay? Or underline it. Pay attention. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Highlight house of David. Okay, please highlight it because you're going to see that Gabriel is alluding to Isaiah 9. And the virgin's name was Mary, Maryam, Maria. Of all the woman's names, this is the most beautiful. In any language, Maria, Maria, Maryam, Mary. What a beautiful name. Of all the names among women, none more beautiful than this name. The Theotokos. And coming in, what a beautiful name. He said to her, greetings, favored one. Now, actually, it's Kekerito many. Hail you who have been filled with grace. The Lord is with you. House of David, Galilee. House of David, Galilee. But she was very perplexed at this statement and was pondering what kind of greeting this was. Why is the angel appearing to me? Maryam. Beautiful name. 
Gimnet Mari, the mother of my God. Now watch here. Pay attention as we go through this. Okay. Okay, watch here. Highlight this because it won't take me long. Asmar khliti, asmar, asmar. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Maryam. In Hebrew, Maryam. In Assyrian, Surith, as you'd say, Maryam. Even in Arabic, Maria, Maria. Any language, it's beautiful. Lazadat Maryam. Lazda Maryam. Imagining in my language. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now watch, highlight, because a lot of people may not know this, but you should know this if you've been following me. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall name him Jesus. Now pay attention. He will be great. Highlight, underline, great. And will be called the Son of the Most High. Remember that. Son. Son, great, Galilee, house of David. Son, great, Galilee, house of David. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, the kingdom of David. Okay, And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and there will be no end of his kingdom. So remember, he sits on the throne of David, his father. His kingdom is everlasting. House of David, great son, Galilee. You know what Gabriel just announced to the virgin mother? She is the fulfillment of this passage. Are you ready? Great son, Galilee, house of David, rules forever. Watch here. And in part three, I'm going to go deeper. And we'll be done. Let's see if you make the connection. Here's more proof that Mary is the Theotokos. Isaiah 9, 1 to 2. But there will be no more gloom for her. Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 2. Who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea where? On the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Nazareth and Galilee. Hmm. The people walk in darkness will see a great light. He will be great. Jesus will be great. Make the connection. Okay. Those who live in the land of the shadow of death, the light will shine on them. Where? Galilee of the Gentiles, a great light. He will be great. A son born to a virgin, a male child, who will rule on David's throne. That's what Gabriel said, right? Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Here you go. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For a child will be born, born to us. Who will give birth to that child? Mary. You will conceive and give birth to a male child, a baby, a male, who is a son. A son will be given to us. Whose son? The son of the Most High. Are you making the connection? God gave his son. The son of the Most High was given to a virgin who gave birth to a male child who is great. And this announcement is in Galilee. And he begins his ministry in Galilee. Now watch who he is, though. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, El Gibor. Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, the ruler of peace and the Father of eternity, the one who brings eternal life. Now, remember it says, House of David, on the throne of his father, David, ruling it forever. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will accomplish this. Did you see? Who Mary is? Did you see what Gabriel's announcing to Mary? Mary, you are that virgin maiden who will give birth to that male child who's a son given, who is mighty God. Gabriel announced to Mary she will conceive and give birth to the mighty God, El Gibor. She's carrying the mighty God, El Gibor. She's the mother of God, the mighty. Alan, keep chiming in. I'm going to send you to Hamas so they can spread camel piss on you. Don't try to impress me with the knowledge you think you have. I love you, sir, but zip the lip.com. Because the child is called what? The mighty God. 
The virgin is going to give birth to a child who's a son given, and that child is what? The mighty God. But yet, in the next chapter, we're told Yahweh is the mighty God. Here, watch. What more proof do you want from Scripture that Mary is the Theotokos, the mother of God? Sean, you have no faith. You need to get the lot of here. You're a bastard. That's why we need to shun you. You're a son of a spiritual whore. Go become a Buddhist. Get the lot of here, you piece of garbage. May the Hamas spread piss on you. Anyway, Isaiah 9, 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So the child born to Mary is the Mighty God. Well, in the next chapter, you're told who the Mighty God is. Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. Now it will be in that day that the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob who have escaped will never again rely on the one who struck them, but will truly rely on Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. So who's Yahweh? A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. Did you catch it? Yahweh is the mighty God. But in Isaiah 9, a child is born who's the mighty God. And Gabriel announced, you're the mother of that child. Miriam, you're the mother of that child. What child, Gabriel? The mighty God in the flesh. You will conceive and give birth to the mighty God in the flesh. You will give to the mighty God his physical body, his human nature, his flesh. He becomes flesh from your flesh, bone of your bones, blood from your blood. You're carrying Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, the mighty God. That's who Mary is. Did you catch it? That's who Mary is. That's what Gabriel was announcing to her. You will give birth to a son. He'll be great. Great light of Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. He's the son of the highest. A son will be given, Isaiah 9, 6. And the announcement is in Galilee. And this light will shine in Galilee. And Jesus began his ministry in Galilee. So who is the mother of the child that is born, the son that is given? Mary. And her child is Yahweh, the mighty God, the Holy One of Israel. She's the mother of Yahweh in the flesh. That's who Mary is according to Luke 1, 26, 35. So you understand what Christmas is about according to Luke 1? Luke 1 is announcing the birth of the mighty God who is the God of Israel, who is Yahweh, but not the Father, not the Holy Spirit. He's one with the Father and the Spirit. And this announcement given to Mary, where she's told, you have been chosen and given the honor of carrying the mighty God, the God of Israel, in all his fullness in your flesh, because he's going to be human from your holy flesh. And you're going to do it as a virgin, no man touching you sexually. And if you still don't get it, hold on, I'm not done yet. Watch here. Because then she says, wait, wait, how is this possible? Luke 1, 34, 35. We're almost done. And there'll be more in part three. Luke 1, 34, 35. But Mary said to an angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. But wait. In Isaiah 10, 20, 21, we're told the mighty God is Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. So who's the mighty God in Isaiah 10, 20 to 21? Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. But in Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 7, who's that child who'll be born? He is the mighty God, a son who's given. And Mary is told, you're conceiving the Holy One, giving birth to the Son of the Most High, the Son of God. Who is the mighty God who becomes flesh? That's who you are, Maryam. Shlama, Maryam. Ave Maria. Hail Mary, filled with grace. That's who you are. But if you still don't get it, let me show you this. Isaiah 9, 1 to 2, with Zechariah. When John the Baptist is born, Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and he breaks out and prays. Watch here. There'll be more of this in part three, but hold on. Let me just whet your appetites. Look at the language of Zechariah. Let me tell me if you know where Zechariah is alluding to. Let's read Isaiah 9, verse 2. Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit when John is born, and he prophesied. Can okay, I look at Isaiah 9, 2? Tell me if you make the connection. Isaiah 9, 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in the land of the shadow of death, the light will shine on them. Great light. Light will shine on them. Those who are in darkness will see this light. Now watch what Zechariah says, and we're done. Luke 1, 67. So you can see that he's prophesying by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is filling him to prophesy. Jim, I'm going to send you to Hamas so they can piss on you because you're a bastard. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, and what does he say about John the Baptist who sent before Jesus? Let's see if you make the connection. It's Luke 1, 78 to 79. Luke 1, 78, 79, specifically 79. Who are you, John the Baptist? Well, I'm sent ahead of Jesus. But then who's Jesus, John? Here, Luke 1, 78 to 79. This is Zechariah, inspired by the Spirit to utter these words over John's birth. Because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us. Now tell me if this sounds familiar. Guys, verse 79. What is Zechariah referring to as being fulfilled and the birth of John, who was sent before Jesus. Let's see if you catch it. Look what Zechariah says. To shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. To direct our feet into the way of peace. To shine light shining on those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. But wait, I thought we read that somewhere. Hmm. Isaiah 9, 2. The people walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in the land of the shadow of death, the light will shine on them. Could it be any clearer? Luke 1 is all about the fulfillment of Isaiah 9. Isaiah 7, 14. Malachi 3, verse 1. Malachi 4, verse 2. Malachi 4, 5 to 6. John the Baptist is the Elijah type. The messenger sent, sent ahead before the Lord who comes to his temple. And the Lord is the sunrise who has healing in his wings, Malachi 4, 2. And I'll unpack that in part three. And the Lord is the child born who's a son given, who's a great light shining on those who are in the shadow of death to bring them out. And he will begin his ministry of illumination in Galilee where he was raised and where he began his ministry so that Mary is being told, you are conceiving, giving birth to Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, the mighty God. What more proof do you want that the Bible teaches Mary is the mother of God, the mother of the Almighty God, the mother of Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, Yahweh God Almighty, the Son? There you go. From Gabriel himself. That's Christmas. That's Christmas. We got it? So what were you celebrating Christmas? And what do we celebrate every day? The virgin is conceived, given birth by the Holy Spirit to Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, the mighty God who now becomes a child, a male child, a baby, flesh to redeem us, who's the great light that brings people out of darkness. And he begins the ministry of illumination in Galilee, which is exactly where Jesus began his ministry. Is it clear? Now, I hope that prepared you for Holy Eucharist. Now, pray for me that I get to the Eucharist, please, that I practice what I preach. And Lord, save me from my psychological issues to make me whole. Help me to get healthier and fit and holier, not be vain and arrogant. The Lord do the miracle, bringing my daughters to me, that they stay healthier than I, outlive me if the Lord tarries. And I have them every day, and they love Jesus more, and that I finish the race with integrity and pray for PayPal, Patreon, that my support does not decrease, but I use it for the glory of Christ. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus is alive physically and bodily and will return physically and bodily. The virgin-born Son of Mary and Mary is the mother of God. Theotokos, pray for us. We love you. Pray for us. May the Lord Jesus return sooner than later. May you wash us, our loved ones, my daughters, their mother, in his blood and seal us and fill us with the Holy Spirit to love you, Lord Jesus. Conquer Satan, our flesh. 
and the evil thoughts and desires and the dogs of Satan for your glory, not for our praise. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Lord willing, I may be with God's logic later on, so check his channel. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Love you guys.